On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try Shield Egg. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to the show. I am one of your hosts, Rocky. This is my good, dear friend, co-host, Eric. Yo. Today's episode of Kilts and Culture, special treat, Shield Egg. I assume I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm not, don't butcher me in the comments. Um, this was actually uh, given to us. It's a space side single malt. Um, it was given to us by a customer, and I have to do this just because it's <laughs> it's it's spectacular. I'll spare you spare you the uh, the details of the note. However, this I don't know if it's uh, Rob or his wife Kristen uh, McKevitt. Um, I don't know if it was him or her that wrote it out. But the calligraphy on that's this some, is freaking spectacular. Some crazy good handwriting. Yeah, yeah. I, I it was one of those like you know that those the things you get in the mail that it's meant to look like handwriting. Yeah, but it's just yeah. too perfect. Yeah, the fake, the fake uh, um, robo. Yeah, yeah. It looks like that. It's that good. <clears throat> so I'm I'm pretty darn impressed. Um, so good on you, Rob, for the calligraphy and for giving a scotch. Um, Message with a bottle. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, so we have we have our glasses. Pre-poured today, in accordance with the it's, COVIDs. It's just easier that way, anyway. Yeah, yeah. The uh, this is Shield Egg Single Malt Scotch Whiskey, Space Side. It's 12 year. I'm gonna read the tasting notes for us. Mac, you all ready over there? Okay, nodding yes. Well, I don't know if it's tasting notes so much as just notes, but I found it uh, reasonably amusing. Taking a name from the Old Norse Shield Egg, the Lock of Herring. Is, it, uh, is truly a wild and beautiful place. The sharp fragrance of pine studded islands, the, flask, the flash of silver herring in the dark waters of the loch, the shawls of mist around the shoulders of the nearby Torridon Hills. Raise a glass of shield egg and you'll experience a reflection of this epic landscape in a complex yet balanced flavor of this fine single malt Scotch whiskey. So, Suntory time. Exactly. It's, it's shield egg. Shield egg time. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's shield and eggs. It sounds like a food <coughs> plate. Like, oh no, help me with the eggs. Makes me want fish and chips now. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna water mine a touch. Just just a touch. I think I, I think I overwatered by accident. You overwatered? Yeah. All but right. It's okay. Just a, just a drop. A wee drop. A wee okay. drop. Mr. Mac. How you doing back there? We're doing. You got yours? You ready to go? Sure, we're ready You're, to rock and roll. Are you <laughs> <laughs> Are you watering yours or no? Uh, I'll start without, then I'll, I'll add some in later. See okay. If it, see if it makes a difference. Okay. Fair enough. So, let's take a uh, let's take a sniff. Reasonably light. Yeah. This is saying it's not not very not a very heavy nose. It's got a, it's got a nice pleasant smell. I can't quite place it, but it has a nice a pleasant aroma. Mm-hmm. Mac? It smells like pine and herring. Yeah, I can smell the herring, <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm, I can taste the mist. Okay. I just kind of a generic it's whiskey so... scent to me. It's yeah. not very prominent of any particular thing. Yeah, but it's I'll I'll say this. Part of their shtick is well balanced. Well balanced. Which so, would make sense. I yeah. would say, I would say, well balanced. Okay. It's it's got a nice smooth level Scotch smell to it. All right. Down the hatch. Okay. It's got a little bit of wood taste, but not excessive. Almost like a like a cedar kind of flavor versus a, a, the oak cast kind of thing. Um, You're kind of leading the witness for me, but but I, I, I agree. Now okay. that you say it, it wasn't. Okay. And I don't know if that's power of suggestion or. I'm very or powerful in my suggestions. Um, now, we have not done any, like that's the closest we came to the tasting notes. There's nothing on the bottle on this. And of course we didn't research it. So <laughs> you get what you get. You get what you pay well, for. Well, you don't. You don't want to research it too much because then you're biasing yourself anyway. 
You know yeah, what I mean? We're not, we're not, I would say this, we're not good enough as far as scotch aficionados to know what we're looking for. So we're kind of muddling through it a little bit. At least if they lead us with some ideas, we can kind of go, okay, yeah, I see that. Or no, I don't see that. So that's why I don't mind doing the research ahead of well, time. Well, it's a space side. Yep. I, think, I believe. definitely space, yep. I believe, don't quote me, space sides tend to be a little bit lighter. Um, so maybe like it's, there's no real peat. There's a little no. bit of earthiness to it, a little bit. Um, there's a l yeah. It's, it's like not... dry in the, on the sides back of my mouth. So um, I was going to say it's very short. I'm not feeling, I'm not getting much on the back of my. Fair, fair. I'm getting a little bit of a caramel, uh, back of the throat kind of a. Fair. Residual. I, I'd but... agree with that as well. Mac, are you getting anything aside from your herring and mist and locks? Well, I, I first tried it without any water, and it was okay. a little bit more, a little, a little bit more stronger. Yeah. Uh, that way. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and but the cedar, the cedar, and a little bit more of a bite to it. Um, but now that I watered down, like that, definitely has gone away, and it's more, more mellowed way out. Yeah. Than it did. That's, well, that's why you're supposed to do it, I guess. Right. Yeah. It's I. I used to be a. Sorry about the noise. A a neat only like just straight scotch that was it you know water would ruin it kind of thing um and then eventually through the tasting and that kind of stuff we should start bringing in some chocolate and tasting different stuff with it too just to make it a, like a mini full tasting that would um that would draw out the show i think yeah i don't know if i'd want to subject all you guys to that fair enough but. well we could keep it shortish but the uh uh yeah I, I i i'm starting to dig and appreciate the water with it to kind of mellow it out a little bit was that your Darth Vader there, Eric? Yeah. You're like, oh. yeah. Is it that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Look. It's. I'll just say it's pleasant. Yeah. It's not very strong. It's not like a strong personality in any either direction. It's well balanced. It reminds me vaguely of Oban, but not. Is it Oban or Aben? Oban. Oban. Yeah. It is Oban. Yeah. But Vaguely, but not not a lot. Not excessively so. Yeah, not excessively. Yeah. Um, I think Oban had a little bit more peat in it. Mm -hmm. The um, <clears throat> it's it's a reasonably priced scotch. It's not cheap. And I think I think it was when I looked it up it was like forty bucks or so ish, just because I try to reference, you know, roughly where you're looking price wise. Mm -hmm. But it's a in my opinion, it's pretty for that damn price good. it's good. Yeah, for yeah, that for price that I would price say it's pretty very damn it's good. Nice. Yeah. Usually, I, I, in my snobbish brain, think that a good scotch or a reasonable scotch will start in the like $60, $70 a bottle kind of thing. But this is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm digging it. So, Rob, you know, yeah. good on you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for exposing us to it. Um, it's, I wouldn't have necessarily done a space side, but I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I was going to. Mm -hmm. Mac, what are your. What are your thoughts on it? Let's let's bring it around. Uh, getting ready for the score. I was gonna go right for the score. You gonna write for this? Okay, go right go for, for the score. score. I was gonna just gonna go kind of middle of the road here, like uh, a four point nine. Four point nine. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say like a five point two. Mac and I are pretty much on the same same wavelength. I think. Okay. It's not bad. Six point four. Like that much? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I I would prefer this to several others, even at a higher price point, it's a good, mellow, like okay. relaxing scotch. I would say this, this would be a good fall, spring kind of scotch, where a, a peaty, a heavy peaty, smoky kind of thing by the fire is good for winter. This is a little bit lighter, I was actually, so I might enjoy it more yeah, I'd, I'd, summer, fall. Uh, I'd actually, yeah, I'd say summer, but by fall, I do want the more peaty stuff. I think the there's a, uh, I watered it down a little bit more now. I'm getting a little bit more of a honey vanilla kind of a tone to it. Okay. Um, honey, I'll give you. Yeah. I'm but, not getting uh, vanilla as much. It definitely, honey, it definitely do. feels, it definitely feels like a summer. It's a, a lightweight, but not in a bad way. Yeah. Very good. Hmm. Nice. All right. That's it. Pretty good. Thumbs up from us. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. And his wife. Um, Mr. Mac. Start getting ready with the questions, boys and girls out in the audience, out in the interwebs. Uh, if you have any questions about kilts, culture, 
or novice scotch questions. Give us a, you know, type in any old comments there. We're gonna start with novice one of the ones or that, novice. Uh, <laughs> one of the ones that Eric has pre-ready to go. Okay, so a couple of these questions kind of dovetail together, just to warn you. Um, but the first one, the first one I'm gonna hit uh, to kick this off is from Will O'Hare, and he's basically saying, "Say somebody is setting out to be a serial kilter; they're just getting started. Uh, what would we recommend as the minimum number of kilts and accessories you need uh, to basically make, you know, a lifestyle or go of it?" Like on a weekly basis, what do you okay. need? And I will warn you, this definitely, this will dovetail with the next question a little bit too. Okay. We're on the, how do you get started? <clears throat> how do you get started if you want to be a serial kilter? Where do you go? Um, I guess let's start with this. What do you think the, what's the minimum number of kilts you would want to have as a serial kilter, our slang term for me, me personally? someone who wears kilts every day? Me personally? Yeah. Two. Minimum number two. Yeah, one for, okay. one for nice and one to beat up. Okay. It all depends on budget to a degree, but I'd say the if if you're if you don't want to be seen wearing the same clothes, um, then I'd say probably three. So you can wear one, have one for the next day, and have one in the wash. Okay. If you want to think of it I that suppose. way, try to start with three if, if you're going to be serious about it. If you're just getting hmm. into kilting, this is not the question for you. If, this is if you have a kilt. You like wearing a kilt and you want to wear it more often. You want to know what kind of accoutrement to you know mm -hmm. have with your kit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so two to three. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm thinking in terms of wool kilts, so I'm not worried about washing them as often. Okay? Okay. Now, the beater, I would open it up to being maybe uh, PV or like a canvas utility kilt or something like that. But the for nice kilt, the town kilt, let's say, going around but not doing anything too rigorous. Uh, could be a wool, would be a, tar a tartan kilt, and therefore wouldn't be worried about uh, needing washing too often. And I think from a traditional standpoint, you know, for those of us who only wear their our clan tartan, uh, having one kilt is kind of standard. You just have your kilt. I think there's some traditionals out there who just have their kilt. Yes, but if they want to wear it every single day, they either have to have probably multiple of the same kilt mm -hmm. or... And by every single day, I mean like five out of seven days a week, like something okay. to that. Okay. Y you could wear it every single day, but I'm trying to I'm trying to get in the mindset. Gotcha. Um, uh, I would say if I was only gonna wear my clan kilt, I might get an ancient, a modern, and a muted version. So I have. Okay. If I'm gonna get more than one of the same tartan, I would do different versions of it, different mm -hmm. color palettes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say three. I'm I'm still sticking to three. I think three is a good solid base okay um accessories shirt you would wear whatever shirt. shirt you normally wear yeah if you're gonna get dressed up you wear a dress shirt or a, a couple tattersall shirts that tone well with at least one or two of your kilts if you have a nice kilt and a not so nice kilt as far as like a poly viscose a cheaper one that you're gonna muck up then try to match your nicer stuff to a nicer kilt um if you want to get a tweed match it to the nicer kilt um so mm -hmm. that takes care of the the top half for your leathers, sporin built. I can go a couple different ways. The minimum I'd say is probably two. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. minimum for dressy occasions as well, I'd say three. If you're gonna do three, I would say a dress sporin, a black day sporin, and a brown day sporin. So that way on the scale okay. of formal, okay. you're going day wear and you're going dressy. Um, that way you can kind of skip over the semi-dress if you want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I would do, for a belt, I would do a black belt and a brown belt. If you only have one, black. That sounds like an ideal, like a well-rounded lifestyle or kind of a kind of approach. I would say that you can get by with just one. One sworn, one belt. If, if it's a budget thing, I would go with a nicer looking day sporn. Um, you know, a, a, an elegant one, not too fancy design, nothing too much of a novelty, basically simple yeah um but uh i think it's there's the eating peanuts aspect which if i may is kind of where where this goes next is basically that uh uh nolan uh was asking us basically as a prospective serial kilter he's wondering how much he should spend i mean he's used to you know buying jeans maybe like 30 to 50 bucks for a pair of jeans or something like that 
Um, can he expect a, a kilt to last the way jeans would? How much money is he going to need to outlay? I'm assuming he's a younger guy on a budget um, to, to allow him to get into this. Right. You know, and I think I think <coughs> there's there, there. I think the eating peanuts thing is the answer to that for me. Is that you don't have to do this all at once. Agreed. You know? the, the the budget aspect, I'm going to take a bunch of different directions. Um, one, in the comparison, strictly the comparison to jeans, you're talking about a niche market versus a mass market. So something that can be made hundreds at a time that take less time, there's more automation in jeans versus kilts where there's they're made a lot less of them and there's more hand pleating and hand sewing, even in the cheaper ones, right. it's more labor intensive. So there are, and the cost of the fabric is gonna be a lot higher than the cost of a denim. Um, so there's different comparisons there. So if you know, yes, you can buy jeans for 30 bucks. You can also buy jeans for 130 bucks, 200 bucks. You can buy a kilt for 50 bucks and you can buy a kilt for $500. So there's, there's <coughs> quality as a material, quality as labor, as well as the niche factor, which is like the X factor in this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would say the same kind of thing with, in the comparison to jeans, you're gonna get what you're gonna pay, or you get what you pay for. So as long as your expectations of quality and longevity match what your price point is, it's okay. It's, I don't want you to have, you know, a champagne taste and a beer budget. If you are buying Coors Light, you're getting Coors Light. If you're buying, <laughs> you know, Shield egg, you're getting shield egg. Uh, right. <laughs> the uh, so it's there. There are things to consider. Now, how do you do that on a budget? It depends on your your level of commitment to this. Are you? Is it something that you are dead set on doing, or is it something you would like to do? Is it? You don't want to you know risk your next rent payment or your next mortgage payment to be able to get into it. Right. But at the same time, if it's something you're going to be serious about and going to want to wear and you're going to want quality, then you're either going to want to save up for a little <clears> bit nicer stuff. Does that mean you can buy as much? No, but it means you're going to save up and you're going to probably like it a little bit more. Option B would be what kind of, you know, what are you doing on the weekends? Can you flip baseball cards on the weekends? Can you go to a thrift store, buy something and sell it on eBay? Can you sell plasma? Whatever. It's, it, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to an extreme to make a point. That yeah, yeah. It yeah. depends okay. on how, like how serious you are about wanting a cool kit versus just this is, this is my box. This is how much money I make. This is how much I can spend. And don't think outside of that. Versus, I can only spend fifty bucks a month, thirty bucks a month, twenty bucks a month on my kilt kit, but. If I start, you know, a, a flipping things on the weekend, or if I'm selling plasma, then I can okay, I'll put that extra twenty bucks, forty bucks towards my kilt kit. And if you do that every other month or whatever, I'm thinking back to my college days being dirt poor, you know. You sold plasma? No, but I eat a, ra a lot of ramen noodles. Yeah. Made in coffee pots. Right. Right. So. <laughs> yep. 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 I, was, I hear you. Absolutely. Wow. No, I was a uh, I was a waiter on the third shift at a diner in college. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But um, I, so I, I think I think ramping up counts for something though. Yes. I would say to me, and uh, that's why I didn't. That's why I distract you from talking about the uh, the smaller accessories yet, because I think the core is a kilt, a belt, a sporn, and if you have that, and you've never kilted before, and you've also got the factor of wanting to get used to doing it or building up the confidence to do it, that's enough to start. Um, but for for getting into lifestyler, then yeah, you start mul multiply those. And you start peppering in some of the smaller accessories, and I think you can do it and kind of just ramp yourself up slowly, whatever is your comfort zone based on your finances, so you're not selling plasma, um, you know. And you can do it. You just don't take it as it has to be like I must have the whole thing. Push. Okay, go. Um, there's a. I follow people who dress in historical clothing on a, on the daily, and they make the same point. It's like nobody goes out and all of a sudden is dressing like it's the 19th century 24-7 instantly. You know, nobody Unless has Unless you have a huge bankroll to be able to right. support it. Yeah, yeah, nobody has that kind of bankroll or yeah. that kind of time if they're making the clothes themselves. You just start peppering the things in as you go and you ramp up comfortably. 
So you just have to decide what that comfort level is. So, to accessories, what would you what would you recommend when it comes to like kilt hose and flashes and kilt pins? I would say, I, I am personally minorly, I won't say biased, but I'm, I'm if I'm gonna leave accessories off, let's start there. Okay. What, what can I omit? That's something you could do without. And Steve, another and still way to save money. Okay, save money that way. Mm -hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm. Skin do. And kilt pin are probably the two that I could go without because mm -hmm. it's more jewelry decoration. It's not necessary to the outfit. You can't go without the kilt. You can't go without the sporn unless you're getting a utility kilt. Um, so those are the things I would firstly go without. The kilt hose are a reasonably small investment. Meaning True. 15 bucks, True. 20 bucks kind of yep. thing, 30 yep. bucks, somewhere in there. How many pairs of kill hose to be a serial kilter? Do you have a fresh pair for every day of the week? Three. In a couple different colors, just so you have some options there. Okay, so three pairs of kill hose, assuming regular socks and work boots or something like that on days when you're not wearing the kill hose, maybe. Yep. Flashes. If you have one kilt, then you buy a set of flashes to match the kilt, whether it's a solid color, tartan, doesn't matter. If you have two kilts, then I'd say buy a pair of flashes that can go with both or buy two set of flashes. Again, they're not an expensive accessory. So you can change the look of your outfit a little bit with the flashes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Belt, again, I'd start with black. Sporin, yeah. I'd start with the day sporin. My second sporin, if I'm gonna be dressy in my kilt, mm. if I'm gonna be getting dressed on a quasi-regular basis, then my second sporin would be a dress sporin. Horse if, hair. No. No. If I'm not getting dressed up all that often, then my second one would probably be either a hunting sporn, which are expensive, but I really, really like them, or, or a brown day sporn. Just to mix mm. up, be able to wear brown boots with a brown sporn, yeah. or black boots or black shoes with a black sporn, dress shoes with a black sporn, you know, that kind of thing. I'm imagining myself as back a few years ago when the only pair of shoes I had would be a pair of Docs, and I'm not about to go buy another pair of shoes. Um, so if I were gonna do it, I would prioritize the black day. Yeah. And I would get a semi-dress next. Because in this country, and for, again, for probably a younger person, not to be ageist or anything, but probably most people getting started are a bit younger. Um, the level of formality and what people who are not into kilting recognize as formal is such that you could probably get away with a semi-dress for a lot of occasions. I mean, I even see rental outfit ads from Scotland where the, the sporns are semi-dress sporns. They're not full on dress with the metal cantle. So I would probably prioritize that because a semi dress would be good enough for a good percentage of the things you have to go to, like if you're a guest at something or if it's a nice night out. I would, I agree with you. I understand. I think it's, I think it's more flexible. I see where you're coming from. I agree. Semi dress born is the, the, le the level between day sporn and dress born. It's, it, it's not a super long, historically accurate thing. It's only been around right. for 30 right. or 40, 50 years, whatever it is, right. not hundreds of years. So I kind of have subscribed a little bit to the thought process of it's neither fish nor fowl. I would rather get a day sporin and cover the bottom half of the, the dressy spectrum mm -hmm. and then get a dress sporin and cover the top third or the top half of the dressy spectrum. That's my second one, so that way I have both ends covered and I don't have to worry as much about the the middle part where it's like an Argyle dressed up a little bit but not quite formal. Okay, kind of well, thing. riddle me this, Kilt Crusader. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm in my 20s and I'm invited to my friend's wedding and it's like a millennial wedding or Gen Z wedding and they are not doing a formal wedding, do I want to dress sporn? when I may not have to wear an Argyle or I don't have the money to shell out for an Argyle or a Prince Charlie or anything, any jackets, you know? But they've said, just dress nice. It's a outside wedding, which a lot of weddings are now. You just need a shirt and a tie. Do I want the full dress worn or do I want something just a bit nicer than my day's worn? I'd just wear the day's worn. I would dress, I, I would, I would gussy it up with ha! the semi-dress. Take that. Hmm. No, I would wear, because that's, that's what I'm saying is that <clears throat> basically the, the elephant in the room, if you get a dress worn, is you also then have to have the appropriate jacket to go with it. Correct. So, and, and that's I a would, whole nother expense, which I think people are just getting started or not gonna wanna deal with. Yes, but I'd also, in my mind, the way I'm seeing it in my mind's eye, I'd say you also need a jacket to kind of pull off a semi-dress sporn. A day sporn with a tweed vest, you know, shirt, either buttoned or unbuttoned, necktie or not, um, I think would still look very, very smart mm -hmm. for smart day wear. And I'd rather throw the 
$100, $150 towards a tweed vest for versatility's sake than a semi-dress sporn, which I will probably okay. replace later in okay. my late 20s when I wanted to start dressing up a little bit more. Okay. So that's that's why I'm I'm strictly looking at it from a budget perspective on so how. So am I. <laughs> understood, but it's we're coming at it from different angles of what you want to right. achieve as a final thing, mm -hmm. and I'm just saying now I'd rather I'd rather do this but add here, and you're saying no, I'd rather upgrade this part. No, yeah. I'd rather hit different parts of the outfit before I start upgrading. Now, now you're bringing up a, a lot of things about sporns, and we got a bunch of questions coming in about sporns. Where do hunting sporns and where do full mass sporns fall into this range that you're talking about? Those are very good questions. Sure. Yeah. That question deserves more scotch. By the way, I, you know, I had wired this earlier and just letting it sit and open up and breathe, it's gotten a lot sweeter and a lot nicer. Yeah. But that's... Uh, I will say Nan this... Nancy taught us that, that we should be doing that all the time. Yes. So yeah, I did pour it right. off to the shoulder, or drink it off to the shoulder anyway. Um, <laughs> I gotta get ready for the show. <laughs> glug, glug, glug. glug. Um, no, it's... Uh, I agree. It's... It, it does smooth out a little bit yeah. as you let it sit. And that's yeah. the one thing, unfortunately, for the show, we don't really have, well, I guess we do if we're, if we're pre-pouring. I try, it, yeah, I try to make sure I nurse it a little bit through the show so I can get the full the experience. Full but yeah, it's not the same as like sitting at home alone, well, not alone, yeah. but sitting at home and just chilling by a fire and oh, we should, When did we pour it out? Time. 15 minutes before the show? Yeah, probably, maybe a little longer that yeah, one. Maybe we pour it out a half hour before the show, 20 minutes before the show. Or half hour 35 Sounds like we gotta do some experiments. Yeah. Anyway, sporns. Exactly, yes. Sporns. Hunting, full mask. All the above. Full head mask on. sporns head on. are, yeah, full mask or head on sporns, thank you, apply directly to the forehead. Um, wow, oh, that was a flashback, I'm sorry. Head on, apply directly to the forehead. Full mask sporns, also known as head on sporns. They're technically good for both day wear and formal wear. They are kind yeah. of, they're the one sporn that can kind of float the entire scale of formality. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of people don't wear them for simple day wear because it really makes a statement and it's kind of in your face, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, and and they're very, very expensive. You're looking, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars for a full mask spore. And so a lot of people don't want to, you know, do the beer swill and bar thing with the full mask spore. Some dudes make them themselves these days. We have some talented people in the community who've been making Fair. their own, but, but generally speaking, yeah, it's Yeah, you save it's an, it for it's the nice investment. formal stuff where you're not gonna muck it up. Yeah. A hunting sporn is shaped oval like a dress sporn, but there's no cantle on it. It's a leather cantle and then five leaves that are actually pinned or riveted to the front of the sporn. A hunting sporn, traditionally speaking, was just all leather. I actually spoke to our sporn maker and I said, look, I really like the hunting sporn. It was my go-to day type sporn because you don't get the, the tassels drumming as you walk. And I said, I want something a little bit fancier. Can we replace the leather that's underneath the leaves with fur? That way it kind of dresses it up a little bit. In that instance, it's something I made up, but um, it's kind of, I won't say taken off. I'm not like you know, a millionaire because of it. It's taken off meaning other people have done the same thing. It works well for either tweed, like smart day wear, um, right. Or even an argyle jacket, if you have some kind of medallion or, or stag emblem or something like some a statement piece on it, can kind of dress it up a little bit. It's never going to be full formal because there's not a metal cantle on it and that kind of thing. Right. But it really does class it up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But so yeah. that I would say you can kind of get away with that nebulous gray area, similar to like a semi dress boring, mm -hmm. um, a plain leather hunting sporing probably about the same as a day sporing where you just wear it for with tweed or you know a sweater or whatever t-shirt yeah. yeah i'd say a hunting sporing if you if you can shell out for it is a good yeah is definitely a good option for the for the for general use kind of like what i was implying a semi-dress could do a yeah. hunting sporing is 300 bucks ish 250 bucks ish around that kind of price because it's very very labor intensive um but they're pretty awesome looking not so. to be confused with a piper sporin. A piper hunting sporin, yeah. Yeah, those are kind of a weird hybrid. They were invented <clears throat> to be practical for pipers to wear, and they're kind of this weird hybrid between a hunting and a dress sporin. And yep, it's yeah, basically it's a that. leather I hunting sporin with the leaves but... so that they don't drum while the pipers are marching with a yeah. metal cantle on top. But but yeah, but a full full mask sporin would be another option that would be very flexible if you wanted something that could be dressed up as far as you need to go to dress up. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Mac, was there any part of that question we we're missing? 
No, it was just it, there was a lot of questions coming in about hunting, hunting sworns and, and, mm -hmm. and full mass sworns. Hunting so. sworns are really nice. I mean, they're not actually that old, but they have they have an old feel to them. They're old enough. Yeah. The yeah. I've, you know I've seen you know early or, or you know late eighteen hundreds photos of them. They look um, like really look like hunting sworn. Yeah. Um, late the, late uh, 19th century? Okay. Um, I always thought they were more uh, of a 20s thing, like a 20s or 30s thing. But. Well, man, I'm, I'm not the date guy. I'm not the history guy. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm going through my mental role decks here, but like Prince Charles has a very, very old hunting sporn that he still wears all the time. Yep. It's been mocked up, in fact, like people have bought oh, yeah. copies of it now. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. it's an awesome looking hunting sporn. It's, it's yep. very, very classic looking. Right. Um, but I would... I believe it was given to him, like hand-me-down kind of thing. Okay. Um, but I'm not not 100% on it, so don't quote me on that. Hmm. Okay. Not if I'm all. right, Eric, put the old-timey photos in here. If I'm wrong, just edit this whole thing out. It's fine. No problem. <laughs> Will do, boss. Um, but yeah, no, but I mean, the Hunting Swarm, just, it's just really super classy kind of a look. I would say that it's... Uh, whereas maybe someday things like semi-dress sporns might go out of fashion. I don't think Hunting Swarms ever will. You know what I mean? Um, at the opposite end of the scale, I would say you might want to avoid doing the Rob Roy Sporn. They are they are, they can be you can find some very affordable ones as an entry level Sporn, but um, you'll never be able to dress them up much. They're always going to be for a casual kind of a rugged kind of a look. Uh, and personally, there are some days where I just don't feel like dealing with all those ties. You know, having to untie everything to get open. Um, so again, if you're just starting out, go with more of a standard. You know, less is more kind of an attitude day spore and not anything that's too st too per too much personality, which is a horrible thing to say in a way, but you know. Yeah, simpler is better. Simpler is um, probably it's better. Easier if you're to out. accessorize with. Yeah. Now, what about the the black sheep in the room, Eric? Mm. The elephant in the room, the black sheep of the family, something like that. Um, effectively, the same shape as a day spore. Yeah. With fur body, fur flap, and the metal plate on the flap. It's kind. I don't want to say it's a relic. Um, but it's yeah. kind of fallen out of fashion. Seal fur, seal fur sporn. Okay. The flap made of seal fur as well. Okay. And then a metal plate on top of it. It's a 20s... Armored seal, got it. Yeah, it's a, exactly. Um, armor plated seal. Uh, it's a 20s, 1920s kind of vibe. It's, it's okay. fell out of fashion a bit in, in favor of the dress sporn for okay. fancier stuff. Okay, definitely. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or no, you've I know, I know what the plates look like. I dig them, but I'm more antiquarian, you know? Yeah. I would it's say that that different. could be, yeah, I think, I, but again, I think you get away with something like that. That that reminds me of my attitude about the semi-dress. I'd say you could do that instead of a semi-dress or a hunting sporn if you want something that was nicer and kind of cool and flashy looking, you know, and I think for most people's level of awareness, if you're just out in the regular mundane world, something like that would be good enough for most occasions. I Not would, strictly formal, but... It was formal, it, it, you know, historically speaking, it right. was a formal sporn. Um, I would say this though, I, I think it would be it would be fine for a semi dress you know argyle kind of environment. You're right because most people don't wouldn't understand it. Right. But the people that do would be like, that's pretty cool. I could see doing it with. You don't think a, they'd be like, what the hell are you doing? They they it would be more of the. Well, if they did, you have the chance to educate them and be like, ha ha, this is. <laughs> um, Give them a pamphlet. The, exactly. <laughs> Subscribe to my newsletter. Um, <laughs> no, I could see that with like a regulation doublet going like 20s style and you know, hmm. that being kind of the centerpiece. I could I could Perhaps. dig on that. Okay. Just as a as a different take on 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 formal wear, not wanting to fall into the standard trap of okay. Prince Charles jacket, okay. dress sporn, okay. you know, solid black hose, here's your tartan kilt, done. Just kind of just generic. mixing it up and, and doing something, adding some personality, some little okay. interesting bits to it. Kicking a brand new flavor in your ear. Kicking the brand new flavor in your ear. You have no idea. Oh, I my. don't know what you're talking about. Okay, fair enough. Mr. Mac. Is that old timer music? Old timey rap. <laughs> Mr. Mac. All kick right. some brand new questions in my ear. All right, we have uh, Killed a Dragon on YouTube has a curious question. Uh, asking about firearm holsters and kilts. Do they work together? Not very well. If you're, yeah, if it's Depen open carry. It depends on it depends on the firearm also. Yeah, if it's if it's I let me start with this. Assuming a handgun, if it's concealed carry, then you have to have your shirt untucked and have the firearm underneath the shirt and probably you know either 
kidney carry or appendix carry, um, something like that. Um, if you're wearing a jacket and vest, um, you can you know have a, a shoulder rig. If it is open carry, then it brings a little bit more option because you can you don't have to worry about it you know showing. Um, there's also a if you have a smaller sidearm, you can do a thigh holster. Like a lot of women have it for like uh, uh, for skirts, you can do a thigh holster um, in the inner thigh or something like that. But access to it would be <laughs> awkward at best um, when you need to have access. Um, some guys will actually, you know, put their, put their gun on their, uh, in their sporn, but right. again, it's, it's not ideal. There's no quick draw type scenario. So it has to be. Now you're, you're going with, uh, the, the holster mounted on the belt. No, no I'm, I'm saying in, not even on the belt inside the back of the kilt. I see. Um, okay. so you would actually do tuck it on the inside and the clip shows on the outside and effectively the handle. But yeah. I'm saying the difference between open carry and concealed carry is you're allowed to have it out in the open exposed so people can see it. Mm -hmm. It's open versus the concealed carry. It has to be under your clothing. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously not a uh, an ankle holster. Um, <laughs> that could be awkward. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's always a difficult question for uh, wanting to carry while wearing a kilt. Yeah, and there have been attempts at making uh, sporns that you can carry a firearm in. Um, we haven't seen any that uh, are that graceful with it. I mean, there's a couple of newer designs out now, and there's like the ones that are the canvas. Um, you know, they're, they're more like a, you know, like a molly bag, and they're more like they're more like a, a tech, a tactical thing with the ripstop fabric and stuff instead of leather. Um, I think those are more likely to work in that instance because they are overall lighter. The problem with a leather sporn and a firearm is. Once you have that sporn and the gun and all your gear in the sporn, it's getting pretty heavy and bulky, um, and it's just kind of like, ugh. So yeah. one of the one of the options that Rocky was mentioning is a better way to go than trying to fit your piece into the sporn. And of course, you're limited to what the piece is. Also, I mean, if you're yeah. carrying a lady smith around or something like that, then you can get away with it. But you yeah, know. The, it depends on the footprint, and it depends on the, the to a degree the weight of it because. One of the things that I noticed when I used to carry a lot of stuff in my sporin, my back hurt after a full day. Yeah. So the more you weigh your sporin down, the more it's going to be pulling on your lower back. So if you have a, you know, two and a half, three pound, you know, gun inside your sporin, that's already putting a lot of weight in there, plus your wallet, plus your keys, plus your phone, plus whatever else. You don't have a lot of room. And we're, we've actually toyed around with a design for a concealed carry sporing, but yeah. it ends up being, you know, four inches thick by the time you'd be able to get your hand in there on the weapon, as well as your phone and all the rest of the stuff you want to carry with you. Now, would you find a kilt belt to be uncomfortable if you had, like, kidney carry no. in there? No. That wouldn't bother you? Okay. Not at all. Okay. Um, it's, it, it would be probably actually almost more comfortable in some ways yeah, okay. um, than Maybe. a... Than a regular belt, and it's it's up a little bit higher. It's a thicker belt, so there's less annoyance. You can still adjust how tight that. it is on you. Yeah. So it wouldn't wouldn't bother me one way or the other. Okay. Hopefully that hopefully that answer helps answer the question. Um, yeah. You can look into you can look into some of the sporns I was talking about, but uh, it's probably a matter of just going with a carry that's comfortable, wearing pants, and then just doing it with a kilt. Yep. Yeah. Hope that helps. Mr. Eric will do Huh, what? Okay. Exactly. Robert Guess. I'm that gonna make this scotch. I really do like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and the fact that it's had, now it's had a chance to mellow out yeah. in the glass, I'm really enjoying it. The second so I would glass up my is score. even better. The third and fourth glass are going to be spectacular. Oh, super. Um, <laughs> the uh, line's like, no! We've had a few questions about hats lately, <clears throat> to the point that we were just talking about and thinking we're gonna, we should do a, just a, a dedicated hat video at some point. So look for that maybe in the next few months. But uh, depending on Coraline's workload, but I wanted to do, I did want to get to Robert Guess's uh, question, which has been on the books for a while. Uh, what is the significance of a man's tam, you know, the Scottish bonnet, being worn on the left or the right side, or doesn't it matter? And I think we we know what the answer to this is going to be. 
but it doesn't You're matter. You're the head guy. It doesn't me. matter. Um, there are a lot of myths about hats. One is that there's some significance to having your your Tam flopping off to the left or flopping off to the right. Another is, you know, does it mean something? You have the ribbons in the back of a Balmoral tied or uh, into a bow or loose. Um, that's all basically, yeah, it's basically all urban folklore. It doesn't actually mean anything. Um, there are, of course, some uh, regs for the military versions of these hats, the Glengarry and the Balmoral that go back in time. But if you're talking about civilian wear with traditional Scottish hats, um, you just put it on your head. That's, that's the super simple short answer. If it's sunny, you center it and you pull it forward. They did. If As a matter of fact, yes. Yeah. If the sun is on your right, pull it to the right. Mm-hmm. For a Balmoral, it would be you pull it to the right because the little thing there is on the left Correct. for the cap badge. Cockade. So yeah, cockade. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For a, a regular tam or you know something that's you know just kind of round shaped, there's no right or wrong. It's yeah, just you mush it around to whatever worked for you. Yeah, it's a big mushroom on your head. That's it. Basically, it's practical. That's it. Yeah. There's no great mystery. There's no secret code. There's no secret society of the Balmoral. Right. Um, right. It's. It, you know, there may be one that's, you know, you, you do more often or more people do more often pulling it to the right side versus the left, but there's no symbolism that I'm aware of. Um, no. With the Not hat. really. No. Um, it all, yeah, because they all evolved out of just the very practical, you know, Scottish bonnet, the blue bonnet. What I found interesting about that is that the, uh, the blue bonnet was actually originally a lowland hat, not a highland hat. Hmm. And it, 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 it spread because it, it became very popular. But okay. back around like the 17th century, it was a lowland thing. And it was very much the symbol of the Covenanters, Presbyterians or Proto-Presbyterians who were all about the Scottish church being its own thing. And uh, it's more complicated than that, but that's Google the... Google John Knox. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah, so that, but that's the short answer is uh, be careful about urban folklore. There is no significance to how you wear a lot of this stuff, you know? Yeah. The that's, biggest, that's the main takeaway. <clears throat> the uh, uh, there's a book called uh, "So You Want to Wear the Kilt," and the biggest um, one of the one of the few one of the many, I don't know, depending on who you're asking, um, issues that people take with the book is him talking about. Well, you know, there there's a thing that says that you wear. You know, if you're you tie the bow on the back of your hat if you're single. It's like, and yeah, you, it's like the, the you, myth. Or, he, I think the myth he had in there was that you tie the bow. If it, you're married and you leave it loose if you're single. Yeah, it's bunk. It's yeah. complete BS. No. It's yeah. made up. And that's the reason why you have to double check everything. Don't believe any don't believe anything we say. Do your own research. Look it up yourself. Do you know factual things. We try to give you accurate answers. We try yep. to, you know, tell you when we're not sure with something, we'll tell you. But don't just believe an old story because it's what your grandpa and, told and you. And Occam's razor. Yeah. The simplest answer is very often the case. Yeah. So Agreed. There you go. Quite. Mr. Mac? Mr. Mac? I stole your line. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're the one who gets to say Mr. Mac. All right. So we have uh, Brett on YouTube asking. Uh, he bought he bought a U.S. Army kilt, uh, and he had a red stripe put down the, the uh, edge of the front apron. Yes. I, I remember this kilt. Yes. Um, awesome. Because artillery, man. U.S. Yes. Army Tartan. Yes, U.S. Army Tartan. Got it. Got it. He's, uh, yep. I think, I believe he's field artillery. Mm -hmm. um, do kilts have a particular meaning? Is there, some, is there certain st like stripes in in the tartan that has a meaning behind it? The depends the, on the tartan. The earliest, it depends on the tartan. Um, it depends on the marketing. It depends on the age. The earliest example I'm aware of is the Nova Scotia tartan from 1953, where a tartan was recorded with the colors having meaning. Up until 1953, and the Nova Scotia tartan, again, best of my recollection, no, the colors didn't mean anything. It wasn't purple if right. you're royalty and green if you live in grass. I don't know. Um, there was no, <laughs> there was no real meaning to the colors. It was just a, a pretty design. That's it. That's how tartan started. Was right. de facto <clears throat> district tartans where a weaver just went, hmm, that looks cool. I'm gonna do that. Right. He weaves it and somebody goes, I like that. I'm going to buy it. That's how it started. It was, you know, again, Occam's razor. The simplest answer is probably the right one. It started off just as a fashion thing, just as a good looks, what's appealing. And over time, 
as it evolved into clan tartans and there started to become more symbolism, people started to say, wait a minute, I could ascribe meanings to the colors or I could base my design on specific colors like the maple leaf tartan based on you know, the different colors of the maple leaf throughout the seasons of the year or Nova Scotia tartan basing their things on things or the American heritage tartan based on the flag colors and black in remembrance of the people who have fought and died for the country. It's, it's what the designer, what the meaning that the designer puts into it. It doesn't mean anything except what meaning is ascribed to it. It's, it's art. Period. You see what you want to see and what the designer wants you to see and the meaning that he or she gives it. Then you have some people who just go nuts with it. Like there's this firefighter tartan out there and uh, it's like, it's got like uh, all this meaning with the, what is it? The the lines for 9-11 or... 343. 343 yeah, firefighters. Yeah. Who designed that? Who did that? That was my wife. That was oh, that was your wife. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Um, I would say this. It has almost come to be expected today yeah. that when you're designing a tartan, that the colors and or the thread count, less so the thread count, more the colors, but that there is some kind of meaning involved in it. Right. What Eric's referring to is uh, the Firefighter Memorial tartan on 9-11. On you guys can't see it, but it's on the wall right here. Yeah. But it's also over your shoulder, too. It's over my Ooh, shoulder here. Other Very side. good. Which one? That side, yeah. It's on yes. this side. Okay. My wife, the lovely Kelly Stewart, um, designed the Firefighter Memorial Tartan and included the numbers three, four, three, three threads, three red threads, four red threads, three red threads for the 343 firefighters who died on 9-11. Now, that one, we were, I, I don't want to say lucky, but it was serendipitous that there was a, a palindrome. The number was the same, you know, forwards and backwards. Hmm. So it could actually mm -hmm. be a pivot in the design. Okay, okay. Um, But sometimes, uh, Albanach, Whatever the Bannockburn date is, those numbers are in the Albanock tartan somewhere because Jamesy gave them to me. So they incorporated that date into, into the their design. tartan. Correct. Yeah. Their colors, to some degree, have the meanings that the designer ascribes to them mm -hmm. and puts them in a tartan. If it's a university tartan, um, they may use the university colors in the tartan. Right. Um, right. If it's a flag, you know, the American national tartan or whatever, they may incorporate the flag colors in the tartan. But it's... It's a more recent thing. It's the past 70 years. It's not the past 500 years. It's kind of the icing on the cake. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, it's just, it's a cool thing you can do. <clears throat> you can't do that with other forms of clothing, really. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to be able to do, so you do it. If you consider it art, and if you consider yourself a an, an artist and doing something artistic with the tartan design, it makes sense Yeah. Um, versus just that's pretty, I like that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, we have a lot of blue here in the warehouse. Let's, let's, let's weave a blue one this month, you know. You know that happened. Oh, <laughs> you know, absolutely. At some point, it was like, absolutely. holy crap, we got a lot of green. <laughs> There's an interesting story. The, uh, 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 the guy that used to own <laughs> they jokingly called Kenny Two Shades. Because when you would <laughs> weave a tartan, if he had like two shades of green that were close, Oh, he no. would put in the two shades just because that's what he had. Just to get um, rid of it. Yeah. Ooh. It was. Yeah. There. Did people get pissed? Or did people not notice? It depends on the person. Okay. Some people would notice, some people wouldn't. Okay. I don't know. It's, I never got anything too shaded, but it was, that was, you know, 50 years plus ago. I won't say the name. Okay. I don't think I said the name. Of the, I won't say the name of the mill if I didn't already. But, uh. Okay. You did. You oh. did. You absolutely okay. did. I said Kenny Two Shades. <laughs> All right, never mind. It's the real Mac Shady. Yes. He please stood up. Yeah. Please stood up. Horrible. I'm gonna go all rap references today. That's my that's my goal. Okay. Okay. What, so Mac. What tartans are you guys wearing? Why don't you ask me about my Gangsta Paradise, <laughs> and I'll talk about my tartans, Mr. Eric. Uh, I brought out the Pennsylvania Police and Fire Pipe Band tartan today. Good friends of ours. This was actually one of the prototype versions of their tartan. It was a little too bright for him. We got the cloth here. I got the kilt. But I like it. Indeed. It is this is probably the single brightest kilt I own, actually. Yeah, it's that the and I really the, dig it. The blueberryish shade of bluish purplish in there. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, it's nice. I like it. Um this is the Sinclair Hunting Ancient. Um one of your I, favorites. Yes, it is. It's yep. one of the favorites. Um I like the the balance of the colors in it. Um, we've used this for a few different uh, photo shoots. Yes, we have. And things on the website. Yep, yeah. with the tweeds and everything. Yeah. yeah. 
It's I, I'm I'm a fan of good, balanced designs. Okay, I will say that they as long speak, as they have meaning. It spoke to me. Right, Mac. How about you? I've got the uh, Sword of App and Hunting Weathered on today again. One, one of your favorites, also. All right, next question. Um, we do have a question on YouTube that is asking, "What is there a difference between Family Tartan and Clan Tartan?" Sometimes, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're the Tartan guy. <laughs> it's well. <laughs> I'd say let me let me say the the, the very first thing that comes to my mind is uh, anybody can register a Tartan. Number one. Um, and there are some tartans which were definitely were associated with a person or a family as opposed to a clan, Burns, for instance, um, and Shepherd Check, very old. Yeah, it's highland but, versus Lowland, you going yep. into that thing or no? A little bit, but actually okay. I was going to go much more recent history and go with Irish. Irish tartans are uh, delineated or named after uh, Irish names sometimes, uh, but more popularly county. And uh, there aren't there isn't a clan system in Ireland, so it's irrelevant in that case. So, in terms of design, there isn't there isn't yeah, a, a I difference. I would say that people kind of use it, um, especially in America, interchangeably. It's mm -hmm. you know clan tartan, family tartan. It's it's effectively it's the same thing in America, especially. Um, you may you may if you want to get into the sept versus. Family name, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like Reed being a sept of Robertson, um, or if you want to say McDonald of Clan Ranald versus the standard McDonald Tartan, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of difference there, but I don't think it's so strict or so no. and, black and white. And historically, there people are less uptight about the term clan and the term family um, than we are now. And in some ways, we need to be more uptight about it nowadays to make sure communications are clear but um i was reading an article on um i think it was about heraldry actually but but their, their point was that if you look at historical sources they will say the mcdonald family and they as often will mean the mcdonald clan yeah so it's 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 not a, it's not a clear delineation of terms the further back in time you go yeah exactly mr eric here's a here's a an interesting one. Um, I know there are different ways to pronounce this, but I'm going to say Kinade, Kinade Sim. Um, he's saying, do you ever choose a tartan based on your other clothing? Uh, I wear a lot of olive green and would love to find a tartan, especially a universal one, uh, which would incorporate olive green to go with my other clothes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> We're sure. Uh, we are fashion whores, so to speak. Um, there are certain clan tartans that we will wear, then there are universal tartans that we're going to wear. Um, if there is a particular universal tartan that speaks to us that we, you know, we must have that one just because it's gorgeous the way it is, love it, need it, had to have it, um, sure, we would, uh, you know, make sure we're matching our shirts or, you know, other accoutrements with the, with the tartan itself. Um, I have a closet full of, you know, different colors of shirts to go with the 40 plus kilts that I have you know, directly below them, so it's easy to color coordinate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, absolutely. And Mac does that all the time with, with his collection. <laughs> his hat, his, Mac, Mac will coordinate his shirt and his hat and his tartan. Mac is, he is the dandy. master. Oh. He is the master. So yeah, I mean, it. It uh, people come to it from either direction. One will be, I'm a clan tartan. It's the only tartan I care about wearing. So I'm gonna switch up or make sure that the rest of my wardrobe has colors that coordinate with my family tartan. On the other hand, those who are collectors like us or don't have a strong heritage connection and just want a nice kilt, they will pick a tartan or a couple of tartans on, based on their favorite colors. So it's just two opposite directions to the same goal is basically drawing things together nicely. Yep. Yeah, pretty simple. Agreed. So yeah, go for it. Yeah. What he said. That was a short one. Mr. Mac. Well, <coughs> before we go to our next question, we have to introduce our... Our kilt ambassador for the month is Nate Silva. He's also kind of a culture ambassador. He's a pretty interesting dude. He's actually Portuguese and Polish. And when he was young, his dad wanted him to play an instrument. At age 12, he discovered the bagpipes and they just kind of spoke to him. He spent his summers at the Gaelic College up in Nova Scotia, learning pipes and making hmm. friends. 
including a 15-year-old Mike McNutt, who is one of the founders of the band Kudu. <laughs> Nate wasn't really super competitive with other people. He was competitive with himself to improve basically for his own talent's sake. As he progressed, his love of piping took him in two different directions simultaneously. He had a token role in the traditional bagpipe community as a pipe major for the Highland Light Pipe Band. He was a solo piper. He was a pipe instructor for both you know children and adults. He's a very, very well-rounded dude. Um, and he was also a Kaylee and a folk musician. Through his friendship with Mike, he was a frequent guest performer with the band Kudu on the road. And Nate's kind of found a yin-yang type balance with his passion for bagpipes that he shares with audiences across the country. He balances his freewheeling kudu crazy, as he calls it, with his <laughs> rigid and traditional world competition and, and bagpipe instruction, you know, thing that he does. So I will raise my glass to a well-balanced piper and our kilt ambassador for the month, Nate Silva. Yeah. Cheers, Nate. I think there's, I think there's a lot to that in this stuff. I, I uh, anybody who is a, in their lifestyle is kind of a one trick pony is missing out. Yeah, so, so I definitely, it's, it's like me saying, you know, I like, I like my, I wore it today. I had on my, uh, my uh, heavy metal band patch utility kilt earlier today, but I also love doing full formal Highland wear. Yeah, it's, it's know? fun mixing it up and having a balance of different passions in your life. And it's, it's neat that his, Nate's passions, they're extreme opposite ends yeah. of the very, very traditional and the very, very, you know, crazy rock band type style mm -hmm. of Kudu with, you know, traditional competition bagpipe stuff. Yeah. Um, he's a grade two uh, uh, bagpipe player and he's a grade one. I forget what the, the qualifications are, but it's grade two for like the regular stuff and then a grade one Pebrock player. Oh, so really? Yeah, Pebrock. He, okay. He knows what he's cool. doing. Cool, Nate. I will, I will say that. We don't have a uh, strict criteria for what makes an ambassador, but I will respect anybody who's trying to teach something to support the culture. Um, and I love the fact that he came to it and he doesn't necessarily have a direct blood relation to it either, you know? Yeah. It's the bagpipes kind of stir something in you. Like, I don't have a direct relation yeah, totally. to Scottish stuff, but it's, it, they, they, when I say that, you know, the bagpipes spoke to him, I get it. It's the whole thing oh, absolutely. spoke to me. Yeah. So, Eric. Yes. If someone out there in the interwebs wanted to be a kilt ambassador out there in Webland for USA Kilts, how how would they do how that? How would they do that? How, how would, would you do that? that? Well, it's basically simple. If you or someone you admire uh, wants to become a kilt ambassador, also, all you have to do is post a picture of yourself on your wall and tag USA Kilts. Uh, that's basically at symbol USA Kilts. And uh, you can also send us an email to back that up to sales at USA Kilts.com. Yep. And if you're watching this on YouTube or Twitch, whatever socials you do, put it on your socials and tell us about it. Yep. Cool. Cool. Mr. Mac, next question, pretty please. All right. So we have Ginger Zombie 23. <laughs> okay. uh, he's got a culture question. Question. He is watching from Twitch. Twitch. Uh, he said there has been some, some discussion lately about clan badges. What are the different parts of a clan badge? And what are the historical <coughs> slash meanings behind the badge and its individual parts? For the record, for Ginger Zombie 23, I'm thinking of like Claude Giroux as a dead person, as my Ginger Zombie. For the record, I'm thinking I'm thinking Scottish or Irish Rob Zombie. You know, Fair. dig through the ditches and burn through the witches. I can't. <laughs> Just yeah. edit, edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> edit that. Out. No, we gotta put in a Rob Zombie video now. All right. Yeah, just not my um, horrible Celtic accent. That was, that was really <laughs> horrible. Anyway. I wonder if you could, like, uh, accentify a Rob Zombie song and make I just him tried it. It was horrible. No, but make... I don't know. Oh, like, There's, really tried there it. Be, there yeah. should be an app for that. Um, different parts of a clan badge. Mm -hmm. The crest, which is the thing in the center of the clan badge. Right. And then there's the belt and strap, or the strap and buckle, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, which goes around it. The strap and buckle uh, are effectively the, the symbolism for loyalty to the clan chief, and the the symbol in the center is the clan chief's crest, um, which he wears by itself, um, and he's the only one who's allowed to wear it by itself. Correct. Um, yeah, any other parts that I'm missing? Um, not really. Basically, heraldically speaking, the crest it would be the helmet crest that you wore as a medieval knight at tournament. 
Uh, and these became kind of an ancillary element of heraldry as opposed to your full coat of arms. A, a crest is a lot easier to display anywhere than the full coat of arms is. Um, the kind of, kind is of like the a badge, bit. a heraldic badge that works the same way. But The crest is the bit right on top of the shield, and then the shield is something separate. Correct. Yeah, basically when you're, when you're displaying size. a full coat of arms, you know, full heraldic display, you'll have uh, the shield, which has the arms. You'll have supporters, which are animals or other creatures on either side. Um, you usually have a motto or other symbols down below, and then you have the helmet crest displayed on top. So you get the whole... All the information in one package is basically the idea. Does it have to be a helmet or can it, like, if it's a... Well, it's, it's what was put on the helmet, which is why a lot of time if okay. you see a lot of them, you'll, they'll have it like little ribbon tube thing going across. Um, it's like it's like stripes, like a candy cane almost. Okay. That was basically the cloth um, donut, which you use to mount the thing onto a tournament helm. So okay. imagine like, imagine like, you know, 80s aerobic workout guy or gal Headband, okay. Richard Thick Simmons. donut, Absolutely. yeah, going around your head, sweating to the then oldies. This thing, and then this thing built on top. That's basically. It's just how you attached it. So you'll see that retained in a lot of the designs. Um, I want to see Richard is... Simmons' head on the top of right, the clan crest. right, heraldic badge. Now, that is spectacular. Just yeah, a, a I don't. I don't know where these analogies come from. <laughs> I really don't. It's it's very much a stream of consciousness thing. But um, yeah, now the the only the chief can display the crest on its own. I believe that um, regional regional chiefs uh, can display it with just a with a, a circle. Uh, but the belt, the heraldic belt, symbolizes uh, a voluntary loyalty to the chief. And we had some we had we had somebody on the group who was asking why why do uh, Scottish crests use an English garter as part of their design? And uh, I think Chris or somebody pointed out that it's actually a heraldic belt. Yeah. But I do think that to some extent, I'd have to verify this with people I know who do heraldry, but I think that the idea of that heraldic belt did originate with the garter from the order of the garter, which was started by the English. Um, so it was a kind of a symbol of loyalty and being a member of a special club. So it became a thing for heraldry in general to say, I'm part of a club. I'm part of a group. So okay. I think that's probably the origins of it. But that's basically, those are the only two main parts is basically, yeah. And then you'll have the motto written in the, written on the belt. Sweating to the oldies? Just because that's a convenient place to put it. Yes, exactly that. Or don't be a jerk. Indeed. If anybody out there has not seen the Kilt and Culture kilt pin design. It, it's, it's effectively done. Um, we're waiting for the master mold to be done, and then uh, we're going to do a pre-sale to try to get as many as we can out the door at one time and mm -hmm. have them just cast them up. Cool. Yep, but awesome. the design itself is effectively set in stone. It's just now bringing it forth to the world in right childbirth. On. Right on. But that, yeah, I think that's that's the that's the long and the short of uh, Clan Crest badges. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Mr. Eric. Yes. Hit me. Hit you? You're a little far away. I have to throw something at you. All right. Um, Randy Collins asked us, where would you personally like to see, or what would you personally like to see happen <coughs> in the next five to 10 years in the Celtic community? Five, 10 years from now, where would you like to see things in the community? In the next... Five to ten years, I'd like to see us uh, get back to some sense of normalcy. The uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, kind of kicked everybody straight in the gut, um, and especially the uh, any outdoor events, you know, all the Highland Games, all that kind of stuff. Um, traditional kilt vendors over in Scotland, Irish stores, Scottish stores in the U.S. Everyone has been set back years in what's going on. So I would love to see a return at some point to a sense of normalcy, to a, you know, people being able to go into stores, people being able to, you know, travel to Scotland again, people being able to experience their heritage, people being able to go to the Highland Games and get that back on track and to be able to support the culture in general. So I don't have a, uh, uh, a, a, a huge, forward-looking thing, I have a backwards and then forward-looking thing. Um, 
if I'm gonna look forward at all, I'd say getting more younger people involved in it. There was a uh, article in the newspaper, Robin Elliott owns a mill. His weaver is 80 something years old and the dude wants to retire, but there's no one to kind of come in and uh, uh, intern with them or fill the void or learn what he wants to pass down. So he's kind of, in a, in a way, holding on until someone comes in to, to pass the knowledge down to, learning the old ways, learning the old things, learning to make sure that, that the art, the craft, doesn't just disappear. So wanting younger kids, wanting you know, middle-aged kids, whatever, to get more involved in this, to be able to preserve it and push it forward, push the ball forward, keep the whole thing moving forward. And I've, I've said that before, but that's kind of what this show is about. That's what this company is about. That's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is take everything, encapsulate it and say, this is how it is. Here's how you can apply it today. Get interested, move it forward, make it your own and continue with all this. That's what I want to happen is in the next 10 years, five years, 50 years is honor the tradition, but acknowledge where you are and then push it forward so that the next group of kids can experience it, can get the heritage and make it their own. I don't have a lot to add beyond that. I mean, my mind goes to specifics. Um, I'm very concerned about, uh, there was a report I saw recently about uh, the pretty much de facto fact that uh, Scottish Gaelic is going extinct. Um, I know that there are more people, I know that Gaelic is being preserved in Ireland. Um, I would like to see, well, I'd like to see a groundswell. I'd like to see a, um, another, another Braveheart effect where basically, you know, we've had this fad with, uh, I'm not complaining about this, but we've had a fad <laughs> about Nordic culture the past few years, Viking culture. I obviously don't have a problem with that, but I'd like to see some kind of a popular groundswell which would capture the national uh, or international imagination so that people would be willing to invest in um, invest in the businesses, yeah, but invest in education. Um, I'd like to see more uh, I'd like to see more living history. I'd like to see more uh, focus on preserving uh, language, like I just said. Uh, I'd like to see more uh, attention paid to folk music and traditional crafts. I've always for years admired the, um, the Living Treasures program that Japan has set up to, to try and prop up their traditional crafts and artisans who are like the last of the line um, and try to make sure it isn't lost forever. And I think we need more of an effort along those lines for the Celtic Gaelic uh, community. You know, I mean, it's it's because it's if you're gonna wear a kilt, that's great, but it it it'd be awesome to have the entire gestalt of what all this means be more conscious. Because every kid, next generation, they're gonna be inspired by something different. Every every person is a little bit different. Um, I'd like them to have the options. I'd like them to know how you how you bake the food, how you make the haggis, how you um, how how you how you speak the language. I keep coming back to the language and the music because that's that's the thing that concerns me the most. But the music doesn't concern me, you know, air quotes, as much as the language. The music will always you be there. You have a there. slightly different perspective be... than I do on the music, but but go, go ahead. Yes, now, but here's where I'm going. The language itself as a living thing, I'm more concerned about because it's relying on people actively doing something mm -hmm. versus just preserving something to listen to or just popping it in the CD player. Or, well, that's that's dated in itself, <laughs> but you know, popping it on your iTunes account or whatever, or you know, listening to it a little bit in the car or whatever. The language, yeah, you know, putting the Gaelic version of the English language on the signs in the Highlands is fine, but people don't necessarily know how to pronounce it, even if you're living in Scotland, if you haven't grown up with it. So would you go so far as to say that um, now, we're Americans talking about schools in yeah, Scotland so is what I'm about to say. So take, take this with a grain of salt. Yeah, take, take us but, with a big grain of salt. But would you go so far as to say that it should be mandatory for kids to learn Gaelic, Scots Gaelic, in schools, just like they learn English, just like they take another foreign language? Is, is Gaelic mandatory in Irish schools? Or is it, is no it optional? I'm, I'm, I suspect I'm, it's I'm, optional. I'm saying um, it's probably more, it's more... Well, I don't know. 
I don't know either way. So okay. take that. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think mandatory makes sense, but. Um, would it be an elective at least? I think absolutely an elective if it could be done. Okay. It may be too late. Um, from what I, if I remember correctly, from what I was reading, it may be too late for for Scott's Gaelic. But um, you know, it's it's funny because um, we're in a situation now where uh, you go to a burn supper and people don't know what they're reading if they read a Burns poem. You know, we're, we're even just with the Scots dialect, you're, we're so far yeah. removed from it now. It's like a foreign language. Um, and uh, I understand that's, that's just how history goes. That's the dynamic of history and, you know, language drifts and evolves and that's fine. But, uh, but it makes me sad as a romantic, you know, history nerd, you know. So like I said, I'd like to see a groundswell of popular interest somehow, something to just kick us back into high gear again so that people would want to want to work on this stuff or even just throw a few bucks at the people who are trying to work on keeping the museums open for crying out loud you know interesting thought i think that the show outlander should yeah. include minimum some scots gaelic phrases throughout the show to doesn't it <laughs> I have no idea. I don't watch Outlander, <laughs> but the but including a little bit more aside from like Sassanac and that kind of stuff, but include a little bit more throughout the show that people can pick up within a context and maybe go, okay, that's what that means, and be exactly. able to like basically like uh, include it in their lexicon. Start realizing, okay, I can use this phrase and be cool and off the cuff and whatever. It's you know maybe that could help. Don't know. It's in, because yeah, I mean, uh, Outlander is kind of the elephant in the room with this discussion, and That's I guess I it, it, it has helped, I guess, to 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 a large degree. But it, it's not the same as that huge push that happened uh, when Braveheart came out back in the '90s. But you there's know, that, there's that, a that, that jump started the entire kilt industry. I I agree, so, and I mean, it jump started Scotland. Made this company possible. To a yes, but but there's. To my, in my mind, there's a difference between being able to throw money at a problem and having an instant gratification of, I want to buy a kilt and feel like Braveheart, so I'm going to give you know 300 bucks, whatever, 500 bucks, and get a thing, versus I'm going to spend money on grammar, not grammarly. What's the 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 language learning? Duolingo. Software? Duolingo. Yeah, yeah. That, and then having to spend time and effort and learn a thing versus an instant gratification. That's where I get negative on the topic is uh, in faith in humanity of wanting to actually do something to push it forward versus throw money at a problem which is a lot easier mm -hmm. on an individual level. Mm -hmm. And God knows, I know... Rocky, do it for the kids. <laughs> Think God of the children. You know, God knows, I, don't, I have enough going on that I wouldn't be able to do it. I yeah. speak, you know, conversational German-ish and English. So I'm kind of two languages but I wouldn't I don't have a burning desire to learn a third and I don't necessarily have okay. time but I mean the, the, langu the language is, is a pet bugaboo of mine but uh, I'm looking for a, a, a sense of community and tribalism I mean not the bad parts of tribalism but the good parts of tribalism uh, because that that's where you start thinking about not just your own interests but the good of your people you know what I mean and the next generation you know it's just you know it's like you, you, you I don't know I mean, like, I could go off on this for hours, guys. <laughs> um, but that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see just a general... A return to a, the just, roots. A, a resurgence. Return, a respectful honoring of history, a respectful honoring of what's come before, and a way to push it all forward in a comprehensible manner that people would get interested and want to push it forward yeah. so that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people don't go, hey, what was that whole Scottish language thing about? Hmm, right. that's a mystery. Right. Yeah. Right. Or that kilt thing or, yeah. you know. Indeed. I'm, let me guess how the comments are, Mac. Uh, comments are actually going pretty well. That's um, what I thought. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of people talking about the different radio stations that <coughs> do broadcast in uh, Gaelic. But they're uh, Irish, aren't they? Well, they're, that's what everybody's been saying. A lot of the, the there's still schools in uh, Ireland yeah. that do still Ireland's teach. Ireland's doing a really good job. But they said most people forget it by the time they get to adulthood. So it's a matter of yeah. not using it in, in daily yeah. life. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, the, the conversations that's going on right now are, are pretty good. Um, the uh, somebody did mention that Outlander does do some, but it doesn't seem like they do a ton. Okay. Um, so that it just may be a thing that 
They also have guys in great kilts wearing yeah. riding boots. So. Yeah, so. It's, we got to make it cool somehow. It's You have to entice people. It can't just be a do it for the Gipper. You know, it's or win it for the Gipper. It's got to be, there's got to be a, a personal reason why people want to come at it and I feel passionate about it to be able to push it forward. So it's, my marketing brain is, is an overdrive right now trying to think of ways to, to make people want to do it versus forcing them to do it. It's forcing people to do something, it won't work. Making them want to do it will work. Yeah. I think I think it I think it begins at home. But that's me speaking as a you know tribal <laughs> Make heathen. Make your kids so. do it. That's no, no, the no, lesson. No, 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 no. It's it's basically it's basically uh, I think I think kids need to have a sense of you know what their roots are, what their family traditions are, and one thing we definitely lack in modern Western society is things like rites of passage. Um, and if you look at the history of these cultures we're talking about, it's there. You can find it. You can rebuild it if you want to. Um, again, I'm coming from a heathen perspective, but uh, it's so. So I think that's where it comes down to is I want more education, you know, and fun. I mean, that's that's the thing is it people realizing this stuff is cool. That's the marketing, you know. Yeah. No, but, but I, I would also say this: it's it's almost easier in America than it would be in the home country, whatever that country may be. You got the diaspora aspect, effect. Yes. Yeah. And I, I always, I love the comparison of the people who live in New York City who've never been to the Statue of Liberty. Once you are outside of it and you go to it, you're like, oh, that thing is really, really cool. But if you see it every day and it's just part of the background, you don't worry about yeah. it and that's how it goes away. Yeah, it's like me going to museums in Philadelphia. <laughs> it's like, oh, we should do well, that. Well, no, because even that it's is right there. you it's so actively close. doing something. But I versus... don't. My point is, I, it's like, eh, it's always going to be there. We'll get to it. No, but so. it's like living with a, yeah, I don't know. It's it's living with something as the scenery of your background versus something that's like, right. it's actively pushed to the fore. It's like Eddie Izzard you know, said, you know, I'm, I'm from Europe, where the history comes from, you yeah. know. So, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. So. All that. Ask not what your culture can do for you. Ask what you can do for your culture. Indeed. I hope everyone had some tissues handy in the comments on that one. Just well, I think games are a part of it. That's, no, game, absolutely. Games are a part of it. That's a cornerstone also. Burn Suppers are a part of it. All right. this stuff. Highland right. Dance, uh, uh, the Irish Step Dancing, all of it is a part of it. That's mm -hmm. how it gets passed down. It's the uh, 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 Ken Casey from the Dropkick Murphys said... I remember, you know, talking to him and he was like, you know, I grew up with Irish music in my household. Right. Paul McKenzie talking about, you know, listening to the Sex Pistols and hearing traditional Scottish music coming from my grandpa in the other room. And that's how it got blended together. It's knowing that it's it starts in the home. It starts with what you're experienced and what you're exposed to as a kid. Right. And just kind of making it part of the gestalt and then making you go... Hmm, I remember when I was a kid, my grandpa used to play that. And you start listening to it and go, oh, that's why. It it, it kind of does something to you. Yep. So, and then it yep. in, it in, imbues it it, 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 it makes it hold on and, and pushes it into the current culture. And then that's how it gets pushed to the to the future culture. Right. Like how many times do you listen to, uh, you know, Rolling Stone or whatever interview with, you know, who was your influence? You know, you're talking to a famous band, and who were your influences as a band, as a youth? What did you used to listen to? Then you talk about old bands, and then you look at the old bands and who they were influenced by. So right. you understand the progression of it and how it moved forward. That's what we need to do with this. You listen to the old heads, how it was, the history of it, you interpret it for yourself, and then you push it forward, and then those kids will look at you, and then they'll look at who influenced you. That's how it happens. Done. I, yeah, say done because my brain is just going off. I'm gonna, I'm ready to launch into preaching mode here. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> I've done enough. I'm gonna stop. All right, Mr. Uh, Mac. It's important. That's it all. is. It it's is very important, important yeah. and that's kind of the point. Yep. So, next question, Mr. Mac. All right, we have uh, Pip on YouTube. Uh, it says that some uh, say the second buckle on the right is not necessary if wearing a kilt pin. Um, he uh -huh. said the ones that he owns from us do. Is there a reason why some people have two, why some people have just one? Um, the Genetics. The 
It, it has, I would say, with, I would start with this. It really has nothing to do with the kilt pin. If you're wearing a kilt, it it used to have two straps, one on the left top at the, at the, at the waist and one at the right top at the waist. And the hip strap was kind of superfluous. Um, it still is superfluous to a large degree, especially if the kilt is made for you and it's shaped for your frame. The, the reason why the hip strap makes sense is it balances out the longer fell on the other end of the front apron. The front apron of the kilt on your left hand side, the right hand side as you're looking at it, is sewn down the top eight inches or so that's called the fell. On the right hand side, that's where it opens up. So the top strap keeps it connected to your body. The hip strap about seven or so inches down from the top of the kilt doesn't really do much to keep it closed because you already have the top strap. However, it kind of balances out the left-hand side. If you're a little bit plump in the rear end, because the kilt is sewn down on the left, it can kind of skew or pull to the left a little bit, especially as you sit down. The right, the hip strap on the right-hand side helps keep it taut and pulls it back over to the right side of the body. So I'm not, I don't subscribe to the thought process of it's completely superfluous. You can leave it off. Don't ever do it. Um, I actually, on my kilts, 99%, I think one or two of them have two straps, have the hip strap on there. You don't need it if it is made for you, but n most kilt companies who make kilts today do include the hip strap because it's effectively expected in the same way that two big belt loops on the back of the kilt are expected. But Historically speaking, they weren't necessarily there. So two straps would be a more, in my mind, historical angle to it. Yeah. Just like no belt loops, it's kind of historical angle to it. But current today, 2020, you do have two belt loops. You do have the hip strap. Back in the 19th century, they did wear kilt pins higher. Um, and they did use the kilt pin to try and keep things from flapping a little bit more. And I think in some cases they were putting it through both layers up you know, on the thigh here. The yeah. um, nowadays, it's just a wind weight, but uh, the uh, I would assume that to some extent the hip strap evolved as a more technical solution as opposed to sticking a pin in your in your thigh. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, and you just staple it on. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not really. Don't mind necessary. the blood stains. It's fine. No, no, it's traditional. Um, now, if you're a kilt salesman, you need that strap because that's where you put your cordless phone. You just put your cordless <laughs> phone on there. Lucas and I started doing that years ago. It was just yep. so handy. You're just like, yeah, you're ready to answer the phone. I took my keys in there. We have I've a done little that key fob thing for the yeah, back door here. I've done that. I took my that. keys in there so I yeah. don't have to dig them out of my sporn. Yep. Right on. I stick. I have a, a carabiner on my keychain. Whatever. Night. Yeah, yeah. Adam used to do that, and Lucas does that too. Um, I'll, I use. I have my keys on a carabiner. I'll put them on the sporn chain a lot of time. But that's that's different. Yeah. Now for for me, I have my my keys. I have a, a bottle opener that's shaped like a snowboard. It's like you know two and a half, three inches long, and I'll use that and I'll stick it inside my belt or in the in that top strap yeah. to keep the keys there. Yep. Um, quick access, quick draw. Yep. Exactly. Um, exactly yeah. that. We need sound effects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sound effects. Okay. Get on that core line. Yeah. Yep. Whip cracking and all yep. kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. We should do a kung fu movie someday. Kilted okay. kung fu. I agree. <laughs> ah. I kill for another good. Ah. <laughs> Eric, I like your tartan. It's very nice. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mister. We're horrible. Yeah, we are. Have <laughs> had too much to drink or not enough. Oh, I, don't I know. remember kung fu movies back in the '80s. Coming home from church, Sunday, mid late morning, early afternoon. Sitting down. Kung, Kung Fu Horrible Theater Kung on the USA Kung. channel. Oh, oh, great stuff. PHL 17, baby. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about, mm -hmm. Mr. Fancy? <laughs> Got the old the old dial knob thing there. Yeah, the old chunk, chunk, chunk. Yep. yep. The UHF and then turn the bottom 17. Mm. Good stuff. I Old had beast. to explain this to, I think, Derek downstairs what, <laughs> what an aerial uh, antenna was the other day. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. Indeed. Damn kids. Well, when the internet collapses, he'll have to learn the hard way. Yes. And go back to that. Is it my turn now, or is it Mac's turn? I think that uh, was from Mac, right? Somebody. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with this one then. Chuck McNay 
who I may have, whose name I may have used by accident earlier for a different question, um, wanted to know what we consider of the fl about the uh, what do we think about the flag pleat kilts? In other words, these are novelty. I'm using the term loosely. Novelty <coughs> kilts where the pleats of the kilt form a uh, a graphic like a, a rampant lion or the saltar flag or something sure. else. What do we think of those? Is it okay to have a flag on your butt? The saltire kilt was the first flag kilt. That was designed in 2003 by a guy named Robert Matheson from the Kilt Center over in Scotland. He had the House of Edgar Weaven. It was wildly popular for about six or seven years um, where they sold miles of the stuff. Um, uh, House of Edgar was the only mill to weave the cloth and they ended up making the kilts for Robert Matheson. He ended up doing another slightly different version of it the lion heart kilt, I believe it was called. When you stacked all the plates up, you ended up with a lion. It's pretty cool looking tartan. There's been a debate about it. It's kind of, I wouldn't say fallen out of fashion, but less people care now. They're selling a lot less of it now than they were 10 years ago. Um, the, the question ultimately turns to, isn't that disrespectful? You're sitting on the saltire. You're sitting on the Scottish flag. Isn't that going against the flag code? In reality, no. I talked to uh, Bill Whelan, who's the, the MD over at House of Edgar, and I asked him, I, I said, hey, have you ever had complaints about it? And he actually recalled the conversation that he and I had years ago, and <laughs> I completely forgot about. And he said, yeah, I remember you saying to me, the flag kilt, don't you get complaints about that? And Bill, me being Bill, said, no, we don't get any complaints. And I had told him way back then, that would never fly in America. It's we are too, a certain segment, I should say, of Americans are too, like, very, very concerned about the flag code and disrespecting or dishonoring the flag and that kind of thing. And Bill's response is, in Scotland, we really don't care. It's more of a fashion thing. It's a fun thing. There is not a strict flag code in Scotland like there is in the U.S., we are taking our American mentality on, you know, the flag must be hung with the stars and stripe to the right-hand side, even when it's hung straight up and down, have to be here, cannot touch the ground, da 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 da, da. Um, We're taking all of those American thoughts on flag code and applying them to another culture where I won't say they care less about their flag, because they obviously care about Scotland, but they're, they're less concerned about the the fashion treatment, if you will, of the flag. So it was a huge thing. There wasn't a lot of complaints. There was nobody freaking out that you're sitting on the flag and it's disrespectful. It was just a fun bit of shtick. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of Americans have those kind of kilts. I actually used to own one. Um, I ended up selling it off, you know, five or six years ago, something like that. I remember but, you wearing it though. Yeah, yeah it's back it's in a the day. neat, it's a neat fun thing. It's not your family heritage it's not your clan but it's something different and fun and if you look at it through that lens then sure mm -hmm. have at it are they still popular though um or are they going out i wouldn't say popular or not popular because people own them yeah there's a certain amount of uh market saturation shall we say okay i know that they came out with an ancient version which had, okay. do you remember the, the House of Edgar, um, the the lion kilts or the harp kilts where it's like every other square yeah. had the lion in it? Um, they came out with an ancient version of the tartan and okay. included all those lions. Okay. Still had the saltire when you stacked it up. Okay. That sold less than the original version. Huh. A, market saturation. B, it's kind of died off um, in popularity. It's still a cool thing ish it's still a neat looking thing it still exists they still kind of tick along but it's not the you know 20 miles of cloth sold in a year it may be a piece or two of cloth okay a piece meaning like 60 yards or so of cloth sold yeah. in a year yeah for me i wouldn't do it because there's enough of them out there that i wouldn't want to go to an event and you know be wearing be, be like <laughs> one of two or three guys who have it on so like oh yeah yeah we got the same kilt it's great it's a little different from a clan tartan or something like that. If I went somewhere and somebody was wearing the same clan tartan kilt as me, 
I would actually want to speak to them. Like exactly, hey, exactly. Like, we may have you know similar ancestors <clears throat> or some kind of similar story. Yeah. Versus something that's just a fashion thing that's the same. It's more of a oh shoot, there's somebody else wearing the same thing as me. If you're um, if you're the only person in your community who's got one, then it's cool. But if, you know, I don't know. It's not. Uh, it's, it's not for me. But you know, I'm, I'm in favor of experimentation with kilts and and kilt styles and and tartan and quasi tartan kind of things like that. So. You know, so it's, yeah. on principle, I have no problem with it, personally. Yeah. yeah, if, when fashion stagnates, it will die, period. Right. That's why we we come at things with a traditional angle, but we're still making and pushing things forward and making new contemporary ways to interpret things, not just a, a, a moment in time encapsulation trapped, never to wear anything other than Argyle hose, ever. Um, it's we're trying to push it forward and make sure people can still experience it and make it their own, not just here's your small box, stay in it. Mentality. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you know, what's going to come next is with digital control of fabric looms, you could be able to get, you know how you can get like a photorealistic tattoo of your kids? You get a photorealistic jacquard loom weave of your kid's face in the pleats of your kilt so you can have your, your grandkids mm. on your butt. In the pleats of your kilt, yeah. An actual clan tartan. Yeah, exactly. This get, is my you get actual that, the clan. picture from the family reunion, huh? Woven huh? in there. Yep. Yeah, with the one kid looking off to the side, picking his nose or something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And then you could have each each square in the tartan oh. on the apron could be a different family member's face. <laughs> we'll bury him in the pleats. Now I'm thinking like a Brady Bunch kilt. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. She's always the sporin. No wait, that's Alice. Mr. Mac, save us. <laughs> All right, so we have, where'd it go? It just disappeared. Um, oh. We have Scott uh, asking, what is the difference between the t different types of hose? Cotton, Piper, etc. Do some generally come longer than others? Uh, and obviously he's asking more than just the difference between small, medium, and large. But Yeah, um, sure. <clears throat> it depends on the manufacturer. Um, Bog standard kilt hose from Scotland, from you know, a dozen different companies. Um, you pull the hose all the way up, and if you weren't to fold them down, they ideally would come effectively top of your kneecap, and then you fold them back down so that you have about three fingers breadth below the bottom of your kneecap. That's around the spot where you want it to fold down to. For an average, average heighted individual. Um, the cotton kilt hose we carry and the piper hose that we carry, that most people carry, pull up even higher than that. And it's expected that you fold them down twice and you end up with a slightly thicker cuff on the top of those pairs of hose. That's kind of cool, especially for taller dudes. If you are six foot five to seven foot tall, it's a good option to have a pair of kilt hose that are that long. So you can fold the first fold down a little bit and then the second fold down further to get the perfect length for your leg. Right, right. Um, or if you're a real short guy, you can fold it down twice or, or like three times or fold a normal pair of kilt hose down further down, then pull them back up maybe. Like there's different ways to tweak your kilt hose length to make sure it's the right length on your leg. But there's no one size fits all. There's no perfect answer. It's just kind of... Uh, I don't know. It's kind of a thing that allows for multiple interpretations. But is there is there a uh, more or less an average be across manufacturers of how long a size large is versus how long a size medium is going to be? Or it, typically, the the length in the foot is obviously longer on a large than it is on a yeah, medium. Yeah, yeah. The height isn't that much taller. Okay. And I don't know off the top of my head. I'm kind of talking out of my butt here. Um, a large, I would assume, is probably an, you know, a couple inches longer than a medium. It's not going to be excessively longer. Okay. The only ones that are going to be excessively longer are the uh, uh, the piper hose and the cotton hose, where you actually fold them down twice right, right. versus once. Um, but they don't they don't vary the length of the cuff or whatever so much as they vary the length of the foot between sizes. Is that what you're saying? Depends on the manufacturer. Okay. It's if you're folding it down once, the cuff length strictly depends on how tall you are. Think about it this way. Yeah, yeah, okay. If your foot is a size 
nine, and you are five foot four or you are six foot tall, if you're six foot tall, you're gonna have less of a cuff. If you're five foot nine, you're gonna have more. Or five foot four, you're gonna have more of a cuff because it has to travel a longer distance. Um, and mm -hmm. that's why there's no like right or wrong answer. You're never gonna, oh, I shouldn't say you're never, you might. Um, most people, most sane people, don't say you're, the cuff on your kilt hose must be exactly two and three quarters inches tall. It's, it's a range. It's about three inches or mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. I know when I put on, using myself as an example, when I put on a pair of House of Chivia kilt hose, they're probably a four inch cuff. When I put on a pair of Gaelic Themes kilt hose, they're a three inch cuff. Right. I don't sweat about it. It's, it is what it is. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't look bad or better or worse it's yeah, you're an average size guy though i mean i, I should i could yeah. imagine somebody who's very short or very tall is going to have more concern about geez by the time i get this thing up you know past the muscle here i've only got like an inch left for the cuff it's yeah uh, agreed that, so which is why i think for that's where people, people are yeah they're looking for brand recommendations i think sometimes yes for tall for, guys mm -hmm. it is more of a concern because it has to go higher on the leg yeah for shorter guys i'd say it's actually less of a concern because you can like get creative with a z-shaped pattern on the side of your leg or like two or three zigzags to get it you know you know pull all the way up pull it halfway down then pull it halfway back up or you know whatever to make it look from outward appearance like it's correct and okay. then worst case scenario you have a pair of flashes it's you know mm -hmm. pull it you know do your your z-shape on the side pull the kilt hose up wrap your garters around the outside of your leg so your flashes hang down, then pull the top of the cuff down. You'll just adjust it depending on your body size. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. I hope I help some short guys out. Yeah, I'm thinking, but stretchier is probably a little better for taller guys. I yes, guess. or so. specifically taller guys, Piper hose or the cotton kilt hose where they are going to be longer. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Was that you or Mac? That was Mac. Well, but just... Just to add to that, now, what are your thoughts on either flashes or garter ties? Uh, flashes are easier to deal with. Garter, garter ties, ties are cool. Can be too. You get the ones that are like fake. It's just you know a piece of elastic with the ah. garters hanging down. Ah. Um, the yeah, garter ties are fine. They're effectively it's you know it, a knit piece of cloth, mm -hmm. um, but it's knit so it stretches a little bit. That's what, 25, 30 inches long or so. Mm -hmm. You wrap it around your leg, you tie it in a half knot, you pull them down um, so that they kind of stick out a little bit underneath the top of the, the fold down portion of the sock. It's, they're, they're, they're quaint, they're in a, a, a throwback. So some people love them from the, it looks old timey aspect. Other people think that's nah, pain in the butt. I would say that you might want to try both if you're having, like if you have very wide calves, if you're worried, like if you're, or if you're diabetic or something like that, um, you might want to consider trying both because sometimes the elastic can be more or less comfortable for some people. Like if it's just, it, it, it might dig in more, whereas the, uh, the, the garter ties, true garter ties, you can get a custom fit every time you put them on. So if you're feeling very, if your legs are very swollen one day, it's you, know, you don't have to readjust that metal clip on the elastic. You can just yeah. tie it more loosely because it's a true, you know, it's every time you put it on, it's going to be however you want to tighten it. Um, I can't say I don't have problems like that, um, but uh, I would think that in some ways that the, the guard ties are a little bit more flexible because you, because you can get a custom fit every time you put them on. I'd say but. yes, except if a they're less. Uh, uh, contracting so mm -hmm. they may not they may loosen up or they may not be as tight for a longer period of time for some um, guys that might be attractive understood so. um, if you have a very very wide leg if you're a big dude yeah it may not reach and fold down as long as you want based on the, the circumference of your calf mm -hmm. and we've had customers with you know 23 inch calves uh -huh. freaking massive um, tree trunks and that may be an issue if you only have two little tiny flags and you're you're not be able to pull your your hose down over top. Mm -hmm. But then you get into you know wide hose and that's a whole yeah. issue in and of itself. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's personal preference to a degree. They're fun. They're different. But yeah, they're they're a niche within a niche. I'd say. 
All we right. have enough time for one or two to maybe three more. Uh, we had a gentleman who goes by Irish Oak on YouTube, and he said he's wondering what our opinion is of Coyote Firstborns. He remembers us mentioning in the past that <coughs> Rabbit Pelt uh, has a problem with shedding. Um, he was wondering about Coyote because it, while it's actually very affordable as a pelt, it looks pretty decent. Does it have the same shedding problem? How can you tell what furs are good and what are bad for shedding? Yeah. I wanted to do a little bit of research, so I called our spore maker over in Scotland, talked to him. So I'm going to throw him under the bus. If this stuff is wrong, <laughs> Sorry, he Greg. agreed with me. <laughs> so he had some strong suspicions, but he wanted to talk to a tannery or someone who treats the skins, um, the hair fur, you know, the fur and stuff, to right. make sure that he was correct, but he felt this way. Um, Rabbit fur sporans tend to uh, shed a bit more over time than most other furs. I'm trying to figure out why that was. One, it could be the quality of the tanning or the treatment of the fur when, you know, when they're actually producing it and selling the, the actual fur pelts. How well is it done? Second thing, rabbit fur tends to be softer and finer than a lot of other furs. Okay. So it's easier for as you're, you know, you're you're touching it for the fur to fall out over time. Third is the softer the sporin, a lot of guys tend to just sit there and kind of like play with the tassels or touch the sporin fur or it depends on what it's rubbing against. I'm I'm joking but I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah, I get you. You know, if like I'm I'm guilty of it when I have in my uh uh, my mink spore, and I'll sit, I find myself just sitting there like playing with the tassels at a formal dinner. Like, this looks very, very odd. I shouldn't be doing this, <laughs> but I can't stop myself. Um, <laughs> or it depends on like if it's the sides of the spore are rubbing against your kilt. How old is the spore? Right. So it can be affected. It, that can be have an effect on it. The another thing I would say is the age of the spore and the the dryness of the leather. The, if you think about it, you yeah. know, on a, a very, very basic level, the fur from a sporin is hair. It's the top layer of skin plus the hair coming out of it. So as the sporin and as the leather ages and gets older, it kind of dries up a little bit and the follicles that are holding the hairs could kind of relax a little bit and get a little bit bigger as they kind of shrink away from the hair. So. As they shrink away from the hair, it's easier for the hair to come out. Um, okay. So for all those reasons, I'd say that finer hairs are probably worse, i.e. rabbit fur, but coarser hair, denser hair is probably gonna be better for it. Um, the only other thing we kind of touched on was water animals potentially versus land animals. Hmm. Water animals tend to have more um, like sheen to the fur and it tends to be like in there better and more water repellent type properties um, to keep the leather uh, uh, oilier for lack of a better term um, over time that's why seal skin is so hard wearing that's why um, musquash is another hard wearing one even though it's soft and has a nice sheen to it and it's a a, a bushier fur compared to seal skin um, but it's still wears better over time than rabbit. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, makes These sense These are to all me. things that I kind of think about or, or, or believe to be true. Occam's razor, it's probably true. I don't have a degree in taxidermy, so I can't say a thousand percent, but I would say I'm 95% to 98% positive with my answers. Okay, makes sense. So, I th so you think coyote would be Okay, yeah, relatively. I think coyote would be fine from an Reminds aspect of... Reminds me of, of fox. Yeah, so. fox, coyote, raccoon, they're all a more dense fur, more wiry, a little bit right. thicker. I would see that working better for it than a thinner, more fine hair. Yeah. So, no cat. Cat, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be very, very creepy. I think Jim Diener... <laughs> Should make a spore now. Inside joke. Yes. Yes. Inside joke. Yes. Cool. We do not condone killing of cats for sporins. But if the cat passes of natural causes and you really, really love it, maybe. I Full know. mask on. 
That's the that's the meta. That's the dark meta of the kitten in a sporin joke. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Good God. All right, Mr. Mac, give the last one to you. All righty. Um, this is something we hear quite a bit, uh, and Jared Jared is asking, am I to understand that the kilt is not is not common from form of clothing associated with the Emerald Isle, Ireland specifically, the Republic of Ireland? Correct. Ish. The, Depends on what time, of per- time period you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Well... I wouldn't. E- I would. I wouldn't even qualify it with a time period. Is it common in Ireland? No. Nope. Has it ever been worn in Ireland? Yes. yes. Um, there were there were th- pushes. There were thrusts to try to make it a little bit more popular in the early 1900s. However, it was never a common form of clothing. The kilt is almost exclusive to Scotland as as we know it today. But there's there's a desire, a want for a pan-Celtic type garment, if you will. And a lot of people of Irish descent, especially expats or uh, 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 the Irish diaspora, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Australia, New Zealand, whatever, um, a lot of us are trying to just latch on to it. And luckily for us, uh, there are some pretty cool looking Irish tartans. They mostly are Irish county tartans, but they were not historical, so to speak. There's the Irish County Tartans from House of Edgar were designed in 1995. Um, There's the Saffron Kilt, which is a solid color Irish wine, which goes to the early 1900s, or if you believe the the Lenya Lenya. Lenya thing, it goes back potentially further, but it really is more of a shirt that's gathered with a belt, Um, but it's not a kilt as we know it, I would say. Correct. So, there's, there's a thing there, there's a muddying of the waters, if you will, but it's not daily wear in Ireland, no. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do you want me to get into it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't have to. Um, the Gaelic Revival uh, and the, uh, the Irish nationalists around the turn of the century, last century, um, were very into uh, trying to either resurrect or invent uh, a national dress for Ireland as a way of boosting national pride. And uh, a few of them tried to make the Lenya uh, with, uh, with, with hosen, you know, with hose of some kind, a costume, and other people then said that was kind of goofy, uh, and, in, including Patrick Pierce, who said, no, that looks too medieval, guys. It's just not working. And then other people said, uh, you know, the kilt, it's, it's Scottish, but basically Scottish culture is a Gaelic culture, so why don't we use kilts? And that kind of took off. So you had uh, you had these guys trying to promote the kilt as a Irish national costume. And you'll have uh, people who are very active in the movement uh, donning it for special occasions and then sometimes donning it for a regular dress. Uh, I found a great portrait of a guy from the National Portrait Gallery. Fantastic Gaelic Revival outfit, solid kilt with a fly plate and this really cool belt buckle. You know, just, I'd never seen anything quite like it. Um, Was it a Sam Brown belt? No. With a buckle brig and strong? No. A holster that was empty many a day? No. But not for long. Okay. Anyway, um, so it, it it never stuck as a thing. Like, you don't have people in Ireland having a kilt that they get when they graduate from college, which happens a lot in Scotland. You know, here's your kilt for formal occasions that you'll use for your wedding. That doesn't really happen in Ireland. Uh, they're definitely much more popular in the diaspora. Um, hence the county tartans, and there's a few family named tartans, but it's mostly the county tartans that were House of Edgar originally. Caught on, yeah. Uh, that caught on in starting in the 90s. Um, they've been around for like 100 years, 130 years at the most, um, as an Irish thing, but they've never been quite the same. It's mostly relegated to bands, to pipe bands. Yeah. Indeed. So we'd had somebody ask, uh, what do Scottish people think of Irish tartans? And the answer we had to, I can't find it right now, but uh, the answer we had to come up with was they don't really think about it at all. Most of them don't even know that they exist. So. I, I, would, I would have one small caveat. The, the Scottish people that do think about Irish tartans work at the House of Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> they think about them a lot. Um, the, uh, uh, the Irish County tartans are woven by the House of Edgar. So that's, you know, where they weave miles of the stuff every year. Um, because they're pretty good looking tartans and a lot of, as I said before, uh, either expats or uh, diaspora 
like the Irish County Tartans, and mm -hmm. they've kind of taken on to it as a way to a, a visible outward symbol of, hey, here's my culture, here's my thing, here's my yeah. family, here's my roots. Um, but the, the Scottish people in general, I'm gonna make a, a broad brush statement based on reasonable amount of knowledge. They don't recognize too many tartans. They might recognize their own. Um, they might recognize Royal Stewart, Black Watch, or McDonald or something that's like popular, right. but they're not gonna recognize, oh, that's a district tartan, or that's the Farkson tartan, or that's an Irish County tartan. They're, it's, it's not top of mind because again, back to the, the Statue of Liberty analogy for people who live in New York City, they live with it every day. It's just background noise. It's something that they see that's always around them and that they never think to dive into it in the same way that we do being over in the US who wanna you know, feel all, you know, all Scottish and, and you know, dive into the family history and into the roots and what the clan system meant and this and that and the other and into the history they kind of grew up with it, so it's just always been there, so they don't think about it as much. Yeah. That said, there's some pretty awesome Irish kilted outfits out there now. And here in the diaspora, it's an awesome thing to do. Um, yeah. What was it you say? Like, just because uh, every every tradition was new at some point? Is that yeah. what you say? Yeah. yeah. Every tradition was a new tradition at some point. Right. So Irish kilts, I'll say, were new in the early 1900s. It never really took off but the Irish County Tartans came out in 95 and they've kind of, they right. stuck around, they're still a thing. So in, we'll, we'll, we'll play this tape back in 30 years, see if we're right. Yeah, yeah, truly. It's, they, especially in the US, in Canada, in the countries where the Irish emigrated to, it will be a thing, mark my words. There you go. That's all I got to say about that, indeed. All right. Question of the day. I want to know, forget legal reasons, forget legal implications, forget, you know, PETA and- Legal? Any, what? Anything. Okay. I want to know if you could have a sporing made from any animal fur, real animal, don't say unicorn, any animal, what would be the animal you would want your sporing made from? What type of animal? If you want to say my old dead dog, you know, hmm. Max, Great, fine, put that. Hmm. But tell me what type of animal you would want your sporin made from to make it a statement piece for your outfit. That's my question of the day. Huh, okay. Indeed. All right. Until next time, boys and girls. Slan Java. Slan Java. You're careful not to go. Ah. Eric, I like your carton. It's very nice. Thank you, Mr. Ah. <laughs>